Hello and welcome back to Mega Projects. Now, before we get started, look, there are quite a few old bald men walking around on the floor of the US Capitol, and I bet they wish they had access to today's sponsor, Keeps, back in the day. Did you know that two out of every three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? No, I had no idea, Keeps. Thanks for letting me know. I really just, that was a complete mystery to me. Actually, I pretty much lost all my hair by the time I was 25, which was brilliant. I wish Keeps had been around when I was younger because advancements in science have meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair you have. I mean, I, I just have hair around the side now and I'm, I, I just have to shave it all. But you don't have to be me. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved drugs for treating hair loss. So you may have tried them before, but never for a price this low. That's right, if you were thinking this is some sort of medicine, it's gonna be pretty mad expensive, especially if I'm in America. Well, you couldn't be more wrong because Keeps gets started at just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, for one thing, there's no need to go to a doctor's office. You just schedule a quick online consult because we live in the future. And a bit later, a discreet, importantly discreet, package will arrive at your door and you can use it in the privacy of your own home or outside if you're so inclined, but that would be weird. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, that's a problem that's not gonna fix itself. Do yourself a solid, and for a limited time, you can go to keeps.com forward slash mega projects or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off your first order. And now let's learn about today's subject, the familiar looking dome that is the US Capitol building. <laughs> The United States Capitol is among the country's most iconic buildings. As the seat of the US Congress, it serves as the federal government's legislative epicenter, a rare example of American neoclassical architecture. It stands proudly atop Washington, D.C.'s Capitol Hill. I mostly know it as that building that got blown up in that TV show with Jack Bauer from 24, where he wasn't playing Jack Bauer from 24, but a teacher of some kind. That was a weird show. The Capitol was designed by a group of men who had absolutely no experience in professional architecture. Despite its impressive facade, it once stood at just a fraction of the size that it does today. It was nearly burned to the ground by a foreign army in the 1800s and was the site of numerous attacks over the last two centuries. The monumental dome contains more than 1,300 cracks, yet it stands firmly as the crown in America's capital city, and it will continue to do so for centuries to come. Especially if Jack Bowers around to protect it, right? Washington, D.C. has been America's capital for more than 200 years, but it wasn't the first, second, or even third option when the Founding Fathers searched for a capital city. The first two significant options were Philadelphia and New York, both of which hosted earlier versions of the U.S. Congress. Philadelphia looked most likely to be the nation's capital in the early 1780s, but a string of events kept that from happening. While Congress met at Independence Hall in Philadelphia in 1783, a local militia of 400 armed men marched into the building. The Soldiers had fought in the Revolutionary War and had yet to be paid for their service. They demanded that the government scrape together the funds to pay them for their work, but Congress responded by requesting that the Pennsylvania governor, John Dickinson, call up a different militia to protect their convention. If I was that other militia, I'd be like, uh, no, you don't have a brilliant record with paying people. Whether because he sympathized with the rioters or didn't trust the local militia to protect Congress, Dickinson refused. This forced the men to leave the city searching for a new home, sending them to Princeton, New Jersey and Annapolis, Maryland, before settling for a time in New York. In New York, the Constitution was officially created, establishing the U.S. Congress in 1789. The following year, they passed the Residence Act, which called for a new and permanent capital. The battle over where to house the government was contentious, and it could have gone a few different ways. The northern states, which were more influential at the time, wanted the capital city in their vicinity. But Alexander Hamilton saw the capital's placement as a political bargaining chip and crafted a deal that would benefit all parties. They would build the country's political epicenter further south if the southern states agreed to take on some of the debt from the Revolutionary War. Settling on an empty tract of marshland along the Potomac River, a French-American engineer named Pierre L'Enfant designed the future capital city, placing the Congress House near its center. At this point, Thomas Jefferson stepped in to contribute what would become the structure's most confusing legacy. Instead of the Congress House, he proposed naming it the Capitol, spelled with an O instead of an A. This referenced a temple to Jupiter in Capitoline Hill in Rome. I always wondered about that. Today I found out, which is another channel I do if you want 
want to check that out. This decision, which has confused Americans for centuries, and Simon until just now, was mostly based on the belief that, like ancient Rome and Athens, the American capital would serve as the modern center for global democracy. Bold. <laughs> When Law 4 was chosen to outline Federal City, he was tentatively given the job of designing the capital. However, while his layout for Washington was used, his blueprints for the building were never put to use. In fact, he never actually created blueprints, claiming to have all the ideas up in his head. So Law 4 was removed as the architect and Thomas Jefferson organized a design competition. I guess when you're building a really important building, they'd be like, Law 4, you can't just have them in your head, man. It doesn't work like that. It's a giant building. At the time, architectural talent was lacking in the US, especially for structures of the size and scale they were looking for. The most promising entry was by a French-American named Stephen Hallett, but his design was rejected for looking too French. Instead, Hallett was kept on the sidelines as a potential contributor. After the competition ended, an amateur architect named William Thornton submitted a blueprint influenced by the Louvre's eastern front, including a small dome. Washington praised the design for its grandeur, simplicity, and beauty, officially approving it in 1790. On the condition that Thornton worked with Hallett and others to fix a few key issues. Work commenced shortly thereafter with the laying of the first foundation stone on September 18, 1793. This occasion, the occasion was marked in typical early American fashion with George Washington and eight others dressing up in full Masonic regalia to place the stone in a traditional Freemason ceremony. That must have looked pretty damn odd. As work proceeded, the five-man team of designers butt heads amongst themselves and others, sometimes with Washington, Jefferson, and other founding fathers. In fact, Hallett, the Frenchman whose design was rejected, was quickly fired from his position overseeing construction for attempting to implement his initial plan. <laughs> Legend. <laughs> A man that, no, 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 that doesn't go over there. Ignore those plans. It goes there. Sorry. It uh, goes there. I gotta do a French accent. A man named George Hadfield would take on Hallett's role, but would also vacate the position within three years for disagreements with Thornton and other key figures. While we now know the key contributors in designing and overseeing the project, there's little historical reference to the people who actually built it. In retrospect, it seems pretty clear that the majority of the workforce would have been Southern slaves. As renovations continued throughout the next several decades, slave labor was used almost exclusively, and they wanted it to be a global symbol of democracy. Brilliant work! It seems overwhelmingly obvious that it would have been used in the initial construction, though some historians refute this claim, perhaps to avoid the moral dilemma. Great job, guys. In 1800, the building's northern wing was completed, hosting both the House and the Senate in the government's first official session in Washington on November the 17th of that year. The north section became the permanent Senate chamber while the southern wing was completed in 1811, and it would serve as the House chamber. With construction nearly complete by 1811, the building was fully operational. However, that would change in 1812 with the onset of the war between the United States and Britain. The War of 1812 was fought throughout North America and culminated in the capture of Washington in 1814 by British troops who set fire to the U.S. Capitol and the White House. Observers claimed that the building would have burned to the ground if not for a sudden rainstorm that contained the fire. The building was seriously damaged, though, rendering it unusable for five years, while a new set of architects and slave laborers rebuilt the structure. The reconstruction gave way to renovation, which continued for the following decades. Records from this period are much more precise than those from earlier and give us a complete picture of the building. At ground level, its length was 107 meters and its width was 86 meters. Up to the year 1827, the project cost was $2.4 million, or about $63 million today. The significant improvements throughout the early 19th century included running water and gas-powered lighting. The next substantial change would begin in the 1850s, as America's territorial expansion meant that the number of senators and House representatives ballooned dramatically. A man named Thomas Walter was chosen to design two wings to accommodate the expanding Congress. These sections, which still stand and today doubled the capital's length. Following their completion, though, it became clear that the building's current dome, completed in 1818, looked a bit small for the rest of the building, so, well, Walter went and built a new one. His work would more than triple the original cupola's height, placing the building around 88 meters tall. He employed a double dome design, where a smaller edifice with a 30 meter diameter sat within a larger exterior structure. Altogether, the dome weighed in well over 4 million kilograms. For the cherry on top, a massive 7,000 kilogram structure called the Statue of Freedom was placed at the building's apex. 
Following this project, the Capitol's east was expanded to match the rest of the building's vast dimensions, giving it the size, shape, and facade that we know today. Since then, the building has been subject to countless smaller renovations, which changed the interior layout or fixed structural weak points. The Capitol has been hailed as America's preeminent neoclassical building, drawing comparisons to St. Paul's Cathedral in London and the Vatican and St. Peter's Basilica. It draws on the classical architecture of Greece and Rome, with the idea being that it's a nod to America's place alongside those societies for their advancements of democracy and government. Like the exterior, the Capitol's interior is marked most prominently by the dome and the rotunda sitting beneath it. The tiny feature is a large painting called The Apotheosis of Washington, considered the first attempt at the Founding Fathers' deification. Aside from the rotunda, the building includes the two older, smaller wings and the two larger sections, which now host both the House and the Senate. Both these chambers have raised galleries where visitors can sit and watch Congress in session. The Senate room reflects that chamber's smaller size than the House. The Senate has 100 voting members, while the House has 430. The House Chamber is large enough to hold both branches of Congress and other politicians during the President's annual State of the Union Address. Congress people have offices spread throughout the building, as does the Vice President, who is the President of the Senate. Aside from its political function, though, the Capitol has long been an exhibit of classical American art. The Apotheosis of Washington may be the most famous of these works, but it's not exactly the grandest. That title would likely go to the Frieze of American History, a massive fresco cycle painting depicting 19 scenes from American history. The enormous work required a contributor from four different artists spanning from 1878 to 1953. The Capitol is also home to the National Statutory Hall Collection, rising two statues from each of the 50 states depicting a notable person from that territory. The largest is a bronze sculpture of King Kamehameha, donated by Hawaii in 1959, which weighs in at 6,800 kilograms, that's 15,000 pounds. Beneath the building is a discrete complex of tunnels and balustrades. A small subway system connects the Capitol to a few other government buildings so that politicians can move quickly and easily between the buildings. I didn't know that. That's extremely cool. The underground portion also includes a crypt, which was initially meant to hold George Washington's corpse. However, instead Washington requested to be buried at Mount Vernon, his estate in Virginia. The Capitol sits on just over one square kilometer of land, mostly dedicated to lawns, walkways, streets, and planting areas. The most recent addition to the complex is the U.S. Capitol Visitor Center, which rings in at about 54,000 square meters, making it about three quarters the size of the Capitol itself. The structure sits entirely underground to preserve the Capitol's aesthetic dominance. It houses theaters, exhibits on U.S. history, and other features meant to enhance the experience of the three to five million people who visit each year. As an icon of the American government and the workplace of the country's most prominent politicians, the Capitol has been the location for many notable historic events. For example, the first ever attempt to assassinate a sitting U.S. president took place just outside the Capitol's walls in 1835. Andrew Jackson left the building following a funeral when a man named Richard Lawrence jumped in front of the president brandishing a pistol. The man pulled the trigger, but the gun misfired and Lawrence was apprehended. Throughout the 20th century, the Capitol was a common target for terrorist attacks. Radicals have detonated explosives within the building on three occasions in 1915, 1971, and 1983, although no one was harmed in any instance. There have been three shootings in the building, one in 1998 when two Capitol Police, Jacob Chestnut and John Gibson, were killed on duty. In 1954, a group of Puerto Rican nationalists infiltrated the gallery above the House chamber and fired pistols into the crowd of Congress people. Five representatives were shot, but all fully recovered. The most recent shooting was in 2016, though the lone shooter was apprehended before harming anyone. Of course, the most recent significant occurrence was on January the 6th, 2021, when a mob of rioters stormed the Capitol building during the counting of Electoral College votes for the 2020 election. Then Vice President Pence and Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi were among the most prominent politicians evacuated. The mob infiltrated both Congress chambers and several people were killed in the process. The violent actions were mostly repudiated by politicians on both sides of the spectrum as illegal and un-American. Of course, the Capitol isn't only a site for terrorist attacks and violent mobs, it's also where the President is inaugurated every four years. For these ceremonies, the building is outfitted with a grand staircase and a platform for speakers. Finally, the nation's most beloved politicians, justices, and other important figures are given the honor of lying in state, where their casket is displayed in the Capitol beneath an American flag. The most recent people to lie in state at the time of recording were Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, civil rights leader John Lewis, and Officer Brian Sicknick, who was killed during the events of January the 6th. 
The Capitol stands as a compelling reflection of America's complicated history, a country whose founding fathers were well aware of the legacy they hoped to leave. In the worst of times, it's a reminder of America's division. In the best of times, it's a monumental statement about America's grand political ambition. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below. If you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, you know what to do. Leave it in the comments below. And don't forget to support our fantastic sponsor, Keeps, who will prevent you from going bald like your boy. There is a link below. And thank you for watching.